Reverend Nathaniel W. Martin. Here is Reverend Martin. Thank you, Mr. Blackwell. Let me say good morning, good afternoon, good evening, but never good night and never goodbye. I still hate goodbyes. Happy New Year to everyone uh, who's listening in. Welcome to a program called It's Time, broadcast called It's Time, podcast called It's Time. My name is Reverend Nathaniel W. Martin. I'm the pastor of the New Life Institutional Baptist Church uh, here in Los Angeles. And what is it time for? You should always ask. Hey, it's time for justice, for judgment, for righteousness, for equality. That means environmental equality, environmental justice, and it always mean, means in our culture economic justice, which must include reparation for past illegalities and wrongs done by the government of the United States of America against the people of the United States of America, uh, i.e. black people or colored people as we have been variously identified. Uh, it is always time to do right according to the scriptures. Let us look at the Bible. I uh, have a new text for us today in the book of Ezekiel the prophet in uh, chapter 22. I'm going to read a couple of verses that says, The people of the land, note this please, have used oppression, oppression, note that word, oppression, and exercised robbery and have vexed the poor and needy. Yea, they have oppressed the stranger wrongfully. Verse number uh, 30 says, And I sought for a man among them that should make up the hedge and stand in the gap uh, before me that I should not destroy the land, but I found none. What a terrible indictment. Let me read that again. And I sought for a man among them that should make up the hedge and stand in the gap before me for the land that I should not destroy it. But I found none. It means when God looked for someone to do right, there was nobody. It reminds me of the statement that was uh, recorded uh, in the 59th chapter of uh, Isaiah that uh, goes on to say that the Lord saw it and it displeased him that there was no judgment and he saw that there was no man and he wondered that there was no intercessor. Now I'm going to ex another verse, another source of scripture in the 24th chapter of uh, Deuteronomy Old Testament. It says these words, Thou shalt not oppress, note that word, oppress and hired servant that is poor and what? Needy, whether he be of thy brethren or of thy strangers that are in thy land within thy gates. At his day thou shalt give him his hire, neither shall the sun go down upon it, for he is poor and setteth his heart upon it, lest he cry against thee unto the Lord, and it be sin unto thee. Ezekiel, in his day, which was thousands of years after Moses, and yet the needy were being vexed, and the poor were being defrauded, and God couldn't find anybody worthwhile or righteous enough to stand before him and say, Lord, have mercy, that God should not destroy the land. What a terrible indictment. And in the New Testament, we find that regarding employment and unemployment and labor and management, it says in James chapter 5 and verse 4, Behold, the hire of the laborers who have reaped down your fields, which is of you kept back by fraud, crieth. And the cries of them which have reaped are entered into the ears of the Lord of Sabaoth. We may not think God is concerned about what we do to one another, but 
if you search the Bible, you find that God is vitally interested in how we treat one another. And truly, in the United States of America at this hour, we need to be concerned about how we are being treated by the government. We are in uh, the second week of a government shutdown all across this great nation, a partial government uh, shutdown that so far in the uh, park, the scenic parks, uh, has resulted in the deaths of three people already. And we're only into the second week of a government shutdown. What is a government shutdown? Why the President of the United States of America has decided in his own judgment that he wants to shut down the government until he gets his way. And the only pawns in the game are we, the people of the United States of America. I wonder if we're going to get any reparations or recompense uh, out of this uh, consequences of the result of this government shutdown. We have today uh, over 400,000 federal workers that didn't receive any checks for Christmas or New Year's and are not going to receive any checks uh, this month, according to the president, because he's planning to go on into February as of this date. Uh, hopefully he would will have some great uh, revelation come his way and uh, will change his mind and will uh, work with the Congress that represents we, the people of the United States of America, indeed, in order to form a more perfect union. But I'd say all of those things in order to, for you to see just how easily we are oppressed and how easy it is to become an oppressor. But one thing I must always hasten to add, God is never on the side of the oppressor. God is always on the side of the oppressed. Whenever you begin to oppress God's people, look out, because you are really saying, I am oppressing God. Because how can you say, as the Scripture declares unto us, that you love God whom you have never seen and oppress or hate your brothers and your sisters whom you see every day and who are in the image and the likeness of God? The last time we met, we were talking about security. Oh, how the government loves to tell us about security. Huh? The TSA in, in and out the airports and the harbors uh, of our nation. But, of course, that is only what? Physical uh, security. And what we come to find in uh, these United States under this capitalistic system is that if you do not have economic uh, security, then you are not secure. You will never be secure in your person for, um, from unreasonable searches and seizures, especially if you're homeless and uh, all your things are out on the street, you're going to be prodded along, told to move along, get out of here, go somewhere else. Uh, and so uh, you will never have economic security if the prices of the goods and services that you need uh, are increased annually or every five years when your income is fixed at a certain amount every month or every week. And God knows every day. You say, what does this have to do with Scripture? Why, it has everything to do with Scripture. God is not a God that is far off. God is Emmanuel. That means God with us. He's not merely God transcendent, but he is also God imminent. That means that God pays close attention, is deeply involved in the lives and the sufferings and in the welfare of humanity. I wish I could get an amen on that one. God is not only concerned about the entire general creation and, and the entire galaxies, worlds without end that he has made, but he is even more so definitely and intimately and particularly concerned about how his people are being treated and manipulated. Look at all of the thousands of verses 
of Scripture in the Bible, of which I've only read three sections that talk about the fact of, that demonstrate the fact of God's great concern. Notice, as he said in the book of Ezekiel, in that 22nd chapter, in that 30th verse, and I sought for a man among them that should make up the hedge or stand in the gap before me for the land that I should not destroy it. God is merciful. Hundred and uh, number of the psalm gives us that grand panoramic statement. God is good, his mercy is everlasting, his truth endureth to all generations. That is not mere pablum. Those are not empty words. It is because as the, of the Lord's mercies, as, the, as uh, Jeremiah said in the book of Lamentations, that we are not consumed. His mercies are renewed every morning. And great is God's faithfulness. We woke up this morning with new mercies from the Lord for the day this Friday. New mercies, not Thursday's mercies, but Friday's mercies. Not 2018 mercies, but 2019 mercies. God's mercies are renewed every morning. And I wonder if who among us will make up the hedge or stand in the gap, which are two very Old uh, Testament type uh, uh, figures of speech. But that means or it symbolized one who got between the danger and the victim and cried out to the king to have mercy upon uh, the victim or the defendant. And in this case, when God is standing up with his sword drawn in his hand of righteous judgment to come, somebody better cry, Lord, have mercy. And that is why Jesus came into the world, did he not? To cry, Lord, have mercy that all of humanity should not be destroyed, but that the condemnation that should have been rightfully ours fell upon him. And now we, who are left behind, as Jesus said, works that I do shall thou do, and, and greater works than these also, because I go unto my Father. So now it is for you, the living rather, uh, to be here dedicated to that proposition of elevating and uplifting the state of all mankind. Yes, we must have economic security. Remember that the late Dr. Martin Luther King and the late Franklin Delano Roosevelt, and indeed all of the New Dealers felt that it was imperative that every man and every woman, every boy, every girl, Regardless of of the genders, no matter, you need to have security, economic security, freedom from want, freedom from homelessness, uh, freedom from uh, lack of medical care uh, and the like, so that when you get ill, you can go to receive needed health care and needed health services. Why is this the only nation left that does not provide health care to its citizens as a right? And yet the preamble to our Constitution tells us about the inalienable rights of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Why, if your life is a sickly life, an afflicted life, how are you going to pursue happiness, my friends? Why, medical care, according to Roosevelt and those who started the uh, social security movement in the United States, they felt that health care and medical care was a right and not a privilege as it is practiced today. Never forget that it was the American Medical Association, the AMA, that blocked national health care way back when social security, when old age pensions and unemployment insurance and all of that was being legislated by the Congress of the United States. It was the American Medical Association that hindered, that blocked, that stopped uh, the implementation of a national health care system. Here we are 
in 2019, and we are yet moving at glacial pace toward a national health care system that will provide health care to all of God's children here in these United States of America. Notice I said provide health care to all of God's children here in the United States of America. I did not say Nicaragua, Honduras, Guatemala, Central America, uh, Haiti, Belize, Cuba. I didn't say any of those places. I said provide necessary medical care for the citizens of the United States of America. I made myself very plain. I hope you understand what I am saying. We must get health care sufficient for all the people of the uh, United States, and we must get that now. Uh, I do not believe we can uh, adequately uh, provide the needed health care uh, for our citizens if we don't build more hospitals, if we don't train and teach uh, more doctors and more nurses. All of that has to do with our health outcome. And so as we uh, are moving into this 2019 uh, year and contemplating uh, national health care, thank God, we must do more than contemplate it. We must put in the infrastructure and put in the hospitals and the doctors and the nurses and the staff that will make that uh, ideal a, a reality and make that medical care right a, a, a manifestation and an actualization in our lifetime. Any job is worth doing, as uh, Ron Oniever said, may outlast the person who initiates the doing of it. But that's okay. The scripture tells us to be not weary in well-doing, for in due time we shall reap if we faint not. Anything that has to do with benefiting the entire society, we must all uh, be willing to cast our bodies or throw our bodies upon the gears of the wheels of injustice to stop it and to turn uh, this nation away from injustice back, hallelujah, to the solid rock of brotherhood and justice. Because uh, until there is an economic floor upon the every person, every citizen of the United States of America, none of us uh, can rest secure in our homes or in our businesses or anywhere else. Why, how can you see the homeless lying on the sidewalks of Manchester and Figaro and Avalon and Main Street and Broadway and Fifth Street and Wall and all over this county? These outgrowths, these upcropping of communities of the homeless, and yet we not be concerned about how God's people are faring. We bear the responsibility to make real, to make it real, uh, the dreams of Dr. King of a promised land. And as we go into this month of January, knowing that we shall shortly celebrate uh, Dr. King's birthday, and after that we shall be into the month of February and celebrating uh, a Black History Month again, we must reflect upon what we, where we have come, what we have done, and most specifically on where we are headed and what uh, a plot of course that we can possibly begin to move in the right direction. And it must cut across class. Uh, we in America, we say we don't have class, but yes, we do have class. We have boule uh, and all of that. Uh, you got the hard for law in every uh, uh, civilization. They got, got those that are doing better than the others, the haves and the have-nots, and uh, the haves that don't want nobody else to have, which is generally the milieu that we have to deal with in our country. 
not because the country couldn't do better, but because it doesn't want to do better. Not that it, because it could not provide uh, medical care. It does not want to provide medical care. Take up any state in the South and uh, listen to the arguments why they will not provide even a modicum of care as it is prescribed in Obamacare for their people. And uh, it doesn't matter that it's called Obamacare. If it was called any other kind of care, they still would not want their, the bulk of their citizens to have good health care. And as I said before, so now I reiterate, that is a holdover, a legacy from slavery. It says if I, if I can't get any use out of you, I'm not going to take care of you. And that is what is uh, sadly being practiced on, and upon the masses of people in the various states. We must never forget that when the Social Security Administration was set up, there were two categories of people that were left out of the inclusion in Social Security insurance. And remember, I said insurance, not an entitlement, insurance. Social Security is insurance. It is something that you pay into. It was a program set in motion under the uh, Franklin Delano Roosevelt administration by a woman named Frances uh, Perkins. And who labored hard uh, to get uh, unemployment insurance for people in between jobs, uh, to get to the 40-hour work week, to get to the five-day uh, work week, which we used to have for a long time. You can see how we were regressing. Now we're working harder and enjoying it less. And why is that? Greed, the greed. And on the one hand, the need in order to be able to pay for your apartment. Why, right here in the city of Inglewood, a city that has no rent control, I was just told about a person who in December, note, told in December, you're paying $1,700 for this apartment now in December. In January, that apartment is going to be double that, $3,400. Now, where is a poor man, a poor woman going to get that kind of money that close to Christmas? So what does that mean? That means a lot of people who are renting in Inglewood $1,700 for this apartment now in December could not even afford to have a decent Christmas because you got to get the money together to pay now double of what you were paying between December and January. These things ought not so to be. But those are the economic realities in which too many of our people, especially uh, the poor, the needy, and even the middle class, are, are struggling with. That it creates uncertainty, it creates anxiety, uh, it creates a great deal of angst and uh, a, a dark, a deep foreboding in the back of your mind because you're thinking, what's going to happen when I can't make up this rent anymore? And uh, these... Uh, Situation of uh, economic situation uh, cause us not to be uh, secure. If there ever was a city that needed rent control, Inglewood is one. This is a city that will have no low income housing, uh, will have uh, no rent control, which means that you can be priced out of your apartment over time because you're going to continue to get older and your income is going to be fixed for the most part, for most of us. And uh, the landlord will continue to raise the price. we got five minutes, y'all. I haven't got very far. I don't want to sound too uh, discouraging, but I want to lay on the table the things that we will be addressing uh, in the months, weeks, and days uh, to come. Uh, we have a bead on the fact of uh, God wants us to be just in our dealings with the one with the other. And surely if we cannot be just with our economics, with our money, with our finances, one with another, we ain't gonna, we're not going to be able to get, we're not going to get nowhere because we're going to be uh, suspicious, distrustful, angry, and that's going to lead to bitterness and hatred. And that will throw the entire uh, nation into chaos, which in some circles 
some people feel that would be a good thing. But we must try to right this ship of state. Ah, in the back of my mind, I hear the words of the late Dr. King that he said at one time. He said, you know, we are integrating, we, we could be integrating into a burning house. And if you look at the way things are regressing and uh, the way things are going with all of this talk about globalization and uh, with all of the stock market manipulation and the real estate uh, manipulation, it does seem as though we have got a seat at the captain's table, but we're on the Titanic. And so what should we be doing? We must not allow ourselves to be defrauded or deceived. We must neither practice deceit, and uh, we must demand just wages, uh, a living wage in this, in this uh, era with prices going through the roof. We got to have a living wage. Everybody should be making $30 an hour minimum, not 15 because the cost of living is at 30 If you're only making 15 or less, what are you doing? You might be just treading water. If you don't have two people working together, you're going to be in a terrible, terrible shape. And remember, there is plenty of money in the world, plenty of money in this country. There are people... People who make $97,000 an hour every day, $97,000. The 400 richest families in the United States of America make $97,000 an hour. And so what am I saying? As I get ready to close up, and as we listen to the, remember the words of, of God speak, spoken through Ezekiel, who will make up the hedge, who will stand in the gap. Above all things, I say again to you again, my brothers and my sisters, my working compadres who are working, who are laboring to make ends meet. If they don't want to pay you with all of that money in the world, if they want you to work on comp time or work off the clock, they don't want to treat you right, don't work for them. God bless you. We all done. I've had some hills to climb I've had some weary days And some sleepless nights But when I look around And I think things over All of my good days All of my good days Outweigh my bad days, yes they do Outweigh my bad days I just say thank you Lord Thank you Lord I No, I, no, I won't, won't No, I won't, I won't complain, complain. My clouds hang low I, I can hardly see the road I ask the question, Lord Why? Why so much pain? He knows what's best for me My good days All of my good days Outweigh my bad days